Chapter Four of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume Three. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Céline Major. The Mysteries of Paris, Volume Three by Eugène Sue. Chapter Four, The Office. The office of Monsieur Ferrand resembled all other offices, and his clerks all other clerks. It was approached through an antechamber furnished with four old chairs in the office properly so called surrounded by rows of shelves ornamented with pasteboard boxes containing the papers of the clients of m ferrand five young men stooping over black wooden desks were laughing gossiping or scribbling perpetually a waiting-room also filled with pasteboard boxes and in which the chief clerk was constantly stationed and another room which for greater secrecy was kept unoccupied between the notary's private room and the waiting-room completed the total of this laboratory of deeds of every description an old cuckoo clock placed between the two windows of the office had just struck two o'clock and a certain bustle prevailed amongst the clerks a part of their conversation will inform the reader as to the cause of this excitement well if any one had told me that francois germain was a thief said one of the young men i should have said that's a lie so should i and i and i it really quite affected me to see him arrested and led away by the police i could not eat any breakfast but i have been rewarded by not having to eat the daily mess doled out by mother seraphin for as the song goes to eat the allowance of old seraphin one must have a twist indeed capital why chalamel you are beginning your poetry already i demand chalamel's head folly apart it is very terrible for poor germain seventeen thousand francs six hundred eighty livres is a lump of money i believe you and yet for the fifteen months that germain has been cashier he was never a farthing deficient in making up his books i think the governor was wrong to arrest germain for the poor fellow swore that he had only taken thirteen hundred francs fifty-two livres in gold and that moreover he brought back the thirteen hundred francs this morning to return them to the money-chest at the very moment when our master sent for the police ah oh, that's the bore of people of such ferocious honesty as our governor they have no pity but they ought to think twice before they ruin a poor young fellow who up to this time had behaved with strict honesty m ferrand said he did it for an example example what it is none to the honest and the dishonest know well enough what they expose themselves to if they are found out in any delinquencies our house seems to produce lots of jobs for the police officers what do you mean why this morning there was poor little louise and now poor germain i confess that germain's affair was not quite clear to me but he confessed he confessed that he had taken thirteen hundred francs certainly but he declared most vehemently that he had not taken the other fifteen thousand francs in bank-notes and the other seven hundred francs which are short in a strong-box true and if he confessed one thing why shouldn't he confess another exactly so for a man is as much punished for five hundred francs as he is for fifteen thousand francs yes only they retain the fifteen thousand francs and when they leave prison this forms a little fund to start upon and as the swan of cambrai sings to get a jolly lot of swag a cove must deep dig in the lucky bag i demand chalamel's head can't you talk sense for five minutes oh here's jabulot won't he be astonished what at my boys what at anything fresh about poor louise you would have known roving blade if you had not been so long in your rounds what you think it is but a step from here to the rue du chaillot i never said so well what about that gallant don the famous viscount de saint-remy has he not been here yet no well his horses were harnessed and he sent me word by his valet de chambre that he would come here directly but he didn't seem best pleased the servant said oh my boys such a lovely little house furnished most magnificently like one of the dwellings of the olden time that faublas writes about oh faublas he is my hero my model said the clerk putting down his umbrella and taking off his clogs you are right jabulot for as that sublime old blind man homer said faublas that amorous hero it is said forsook the duchess for the waiting maid 
yes but then she was a theatrical waiting-maid my lads i demand chalamel's head but about this viscount de saint-remy jabulot says his mansion is superb pyramidic then i'll be bound he has debts not a few and arrests to match this viscount a bill of thirty-four thousand francs one thousand three hundred sixty livres has been sent here by the officer it is made payable at the office this is his creditor's doing i don't know why or wherefore well i should say that this dandy viscount would pay now because he came from the country last night where he has been concealed these three days in order to escape from the bailiffs how is it then that they have not seized the furniture already why oh he's too cunning the house is not his own all the furniture is in the name of his valet de chambre who is said to let it to him furnished and in the same way his horses and carriages are in his coachman's name who declares he lets to the viscount a splendid turnout at so much a month ah he's a downy one is monsieur de saint-remy but what are you going to tell me what has happened here fresh why imagine the governor coming in here two hours ago in a most awful passion germain is not here he exclaimed no sir well the rascal has robbed me last night of seventeen thousand francs says the governor germain rob ah oh, come that's no go you will hear what sir are you sure but it cannot be we all cried out i tell you gentlemen said the governor that yesterday i put in the drawer of the bureau at which he writes fifteen notes of one thousand francs each and two thousand francs in gold in a little box and it is all gone at this moment old mariton the porter came in and he said sir the police are coming where is germain wait a bit said the governor to the porter as soon as monsieur germain returns send him into the office without saying a word i will confront him before you all gentlemen said the governor at the end of a quarter of an hour in comes poor germain as if nothing had happened old mother seraphin had brought in our morning mess germain made his bow to the governor and wished us all good morning as usual germain don't you take your breakfast inquired Monsieur ferrand no thank you sir i am not hungry you're very late this morning yes sir i was obliged to go to belleville this morning no doubt to hide the money you have stolen from me Monsieur ferrand said in a terrible voice and germain the poor fellow turned as pale as death and stammered out pray pray sir do not ruin me what he had stolen listen jabulot do not ruin me says he to the governor what you confess it then you villain yes sir but here is the money i thought i could replace it before you came into the office this morning but unfortunately a person who had a small sum of mine and whom i expected to find at home last night had been in belleville these two days and i was compelled to go there this morning that made me late pray sir forgive me do not destroy me when i took the money i knew i could return it this morning and here are the thirteen hundred francs in gold what do you mean by thirteen hundred francs exclaimed m ferrand what's the use of talking of thirteen hundred francs you have stolen from the bureau in my room fifteen thousand francs that were in a green pocket-book and two thousand francs in gold i never cried poor germain quite aghast i took thirteen hundred francs in gold but not a farthing more i did not even see the pocket-book in the drawer there were only two thousand francs in gold in a box oh shameless liar cried the governor you confess to having plundered thirteen hundred francs and may just as well have stolen more that will be for the law to decide i shall be without mercy for such an infamous breach of trust you shall be an example in fact my dear jabulot the police came in at that moment with the commissary's chief clerk to draw up the depositions and they laid hands on poor germain and that's all about it really you do surprise me i feel as if some one had given me a thump on the head germain germain who seems such an honest fellow a chap to whom one would have given absolution without confession i should say that he had some presentiment of his misfortune how for some days past he seemed to have something on his mind perhaps about louise louise 
why i only repeat what mother seraphin said this morning what did she say what that he was louise's lover and the father of her child sly dog do you think so why 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 pooh pooh that's not the case how do you know master jabulot because it is not a fortnight ago that germain told me in confidence that he was over head and ears in love with a little needlewoman a very correct lass whom he had known in the house where he lived and when he talked of her the tears came into his eyes why jabulot you are getting quite poetical he says faublas is his hero and he is not wide awake enough to know that a man may be in love with one woman and a lover of another at the same time poor as the tender fenelon says in his instructions to the duke of burgundy a spicy blade of the right cock feather may love a blonde and brunette together i demand chalamel's head i tell you that germain spoke in earnest at this moment the head clerk entered the office well monsieur jabulot said he have you completed your rounds yes monsieur dubois i have been to monsieur de saint remy and he will come and pay immediately and as to the countess macgregor here is her answer and the countess d'orbigny she returns her compliments to our employer she only arrived from normandy yesterday morning and did not know that her reply was required so soon here is a note from her i also called on the marquis d'harville's steward as he desired me to receive the money for drawing up the contract which i witnessed at their house the other day you should have told him there was no hurry i did but the steward insisted on paying here is the money oh i had almost forgotten to say m badinot said that m ferrand had better do as they had agreed it was the best thing to do he did not write an answer no sir he said he had no time very well m charles robert will come in in the course of the morning to speak to our master it seems that he fought a duel yesterday with the duc de lucenay and is he wounded i think not or else they would have told me so at the house hark there's a carriage stopping at the door oh what fine horses how full of spirits they are and that fat english coachman with his white wig and brown livery striped with silver and his epaulettes like a colonel it must be some ambassadors and the chasseur look how he is bedizened all over with silver and what moustachios oh said jabulot it is the viscount de saint remy's carriage what is that the way he does it oh my soon after the viscount de saint remy entered the office we have already described the handsome appearance elegance of style and aristocratical demeanour of m de saint remy when he was on his way to the farm of arnouville the estate of madame de lucenay where he had found a retreat from the pursuit of the bailiffs malicorne and bourdin the viscount who entered unceremoniously into the office with his hat on his head a haughty and disdainful look and his eyes half closed asked with an air of extreme superciliousness and without looking at anybody where is the notary m ferrand is engaged in his private room said the chief clerk if you will please to wait a moment sir he will see you what do you mean by wait a moment why sir there is no why in the case sir go and tell him that m de saint remy is here and i am much surprised that this notary should make me dance attendance in his waiting-room it is really most annoying will you walk into this side room sir said the chief clerk and i will inform m ferrand this instant m de saint remy shrugged his shoulders and followed the head clerk at the end of a quarter of an hour which seemed very tedious to him and which converted his spleen into anger the viscount was introduced into the notary's private apartment nothing could be more striking than the contrast between these two men both of them profound physiognomists and habituated to judge at a glance of the persons with whom they had business m de saint remy saw jacques ferrand for the first time and was struck with the expression of his pallid harsh and impassive features the look concealed by the large green spectacles the skull half hid beneath an old black silk cap the notary was seated at his writing-desk in a leathern armchair 
beside a low fireplace almost choked up with ashes and in which were two black and smoking logs of wood curtains of green cotton almost in rags hung on small iron rings at the windows and concealing the lower window panes threw over the room which was naturally dark a livid and unpleasant hue shelves of black wood were filled with deed boxes all duly labelled some cherry wood chairs covered with threadbare utrecht velvet a clock in a mahogany case a floor yellow damp and chilling a ceiling full of cracks and festooned with spider webs such was the sanctum sanctorum of m jacques ferrand hardly had the viscount made two steps into his cabinet or spoken a word than the notary who knew him by reputation conceived an intense antipathy towards him in the first place he saw in him if we may say so a rival in rogueries and then he hated elegance grace and youth in other persons and more especially when these advantages were attended with an air of insolent superiority the notary usually assumed a tone of rude and almost coarse abruptness with his clients who liked him the better for being in behaviour like a boar of the danube he made up his mind to double this brutality towards m de saint-remy who only knowing the notary by report also expected to find an attorney either familiar or a fool for the viscount always imagined men of such probity as m ferrand had the reputation for as having an exterior almost ridiculous but so far from this the countenance and appearance of the attorney at law struck the viscount with an undefinable feeling half fear half aversion consequently his own resolute character made m de saint-remy increase his usual impertinence and effrontery the notary kept his cap on his head and the viscount did not doff his hat but exclaimed as he entered the room with a loud and imperative tone pardieu sir it is very strange that you should give me the trouble to come here instead of sending to my house for the money for the bills i accepted from the man badinot and for which the fellow has issued execution against me it is true you tell me that you have also another very important communication to make to me but then surely that is no excuse for making me wait for half an hour in your antechamber it is really most annoying sir m ferrand quite unmoved finished a calculation he was engaged in wiped his pen methodically in a moist sponge which encircled his inkstand of cracked earthenware and raised towards the viscount his icy earthy flat face shaded by his spectacles he looked like a death's head in which the eye-holes had been replaced by large fixed staring green eyeballs after having looked at the viscount for a moment or two the notary said to him in a harsh and abrupt tone where's the money this coolness exasperated m de saint-remy he he the idol of the women the envy of the men the model of the first society in paris the dreaded duellist produced no effect on a wretched attorney at law it was horrid and although he was only tete-a-tete -tete with jacques ferrand his pride revolted where are the bills inquired the viscount abruptly with the point of one of his fingers as hard as iron and covered with red hair the notary rapped on a large leathern pocket-book which lay close beside him resolved on being as laconic although trembling with rage m de saint-remy took from the pocket of his upper coat a russian leather pocket-book with gold clasps from which he drew forth forty notes of a thousand francs each and showed them to the notary how many are there he inquired forty thousand francs hand them to me take them and let this have a speedy termination ply your trade pay yourself and give me the bills said the viscount as he threw the notes on the table with an impatient air the notary took up the bank-notes rose went close to the window to examine them turning and returning them over and over one by one with an attention so scrupulous and really so insulting for m de saint-remy that the viscount actually turned pale with rage jacques ferrand as if he had guessed the thoughts which were passing in the viscount's mind shook his head turned half towards him and said to him with an indefinable accent i have seen m de saint-remy confused for a moment said dryly what forge bank-notes replied the notary continuing his scrutiny of a note which he had not yet examined what do you mean by that remark sir jacques ferrand paused a moment looked steadfastly at the viscount through his glasses then shrugging his shoulders slightly 
he continued to investigate the notes without uttering a syllable monsieur notary i would wish you to learn that when i ask a question i have an answer cried m de saint-remy exasperated at the coolness of jacques ferrand these notes are good said the notary turning towards his bureau whence he took a small bundle of stamped papers to which were annexed two bills of exchange then putting down one of the bank-notes for one thousand francs and three rouleaux of one hundred francs each on the table he said to m de saint-remy pointing to the money and the bills with his finger here's your change out of the forty thousand francs my client has desired me to deduct the expenses the viscount had contained himself with great difficulty whilst jacques ferrand was making out the account and instead of taking up the money he exclaimed in a voice that literally shook with passion i beg to know sir what you meant by saying whilst you looked at the bank-notes which i handed to you that you had seen forged notes what i meant yes because i sent for you to come here on a matter of forgery and the notary fixed his green spectacles on the viscount and how can this forgery in any way affect me after a moment's silence m ferrand said to the viscount with a stern air are you aware sir of the duties which a notary fulfils those duties appear to me sir very simple indeed just now i had forty thousand francs now i have thirteen hundred francs left you are facetious sir i will tell you what a notary is in temporal matters what a confessor is in spiritual affairs by virtue of his position he often becomes possessed of disgraceful secrets go on i beg sir he is often brought into contact with rogues go on sir he ought as well as he can to prevent an honourable name from being dragged through the mud what is all this to me your father's name is deservedly respected you sir dishonour it how dare you sir to address such a language to me but for the interest which the gentleman of whom i speak inspires in the minds of all honest men instead of being summoned before me you would at this moment be standing before a police magistrate i do not understand you two months since you discounted through an agent a bill for fifty-eight thousand francs two thousand three hundred twenty livres accepted by the house of mulart and company of hamburg in favour of a certain william smith payable in three months at the bank of m grimaldi of paris well the bill was a forgery impossible the bill was a forgery the firm of mulart never gave such a bill to william smith and never had such a transaction with such an individual can this be true exclaimed m de saint-remy with equal surprise and indignation that i have been most infamously deceived sir for i took the bill as ready money from whom from m william smith himself the house of mulart is so well known and i was so firmly convinced myself of the honour of m william smith that i took the bill in payment of a debt he owed me william smith never existed he is an imaginary personage sir you insult me his signature is forged and false as well as all the rest of the bill i assert that m william smith is alive but i must have been the dupe of a horrible abuse of confidence poor young man explain yourself sir the actual holder of the bill is convinced you committed the forgery sir he declares that he has proof of this and he came to me the day before yesterday requesting me to see you and offer to give up this forged document under certain conditions up to this point all was straightforward but what follows is not so and i only speak to you now according to my instructions he requires one hundred thousand francs four thousand livres down this very day or else to-morrow at twelve o'clock at noon the forged bill will be handed over to the king's attorney-general this is infamous sir it is more it is absurd you are a ruined man you are all but arrested for the sum which you have just paid me and which you have scraped up i cannot tell from where and this i have told to the holder of the bill who replied that a certain great and very rich lady would not allow you to remain in this embarrassment enough sir enough 
more infamous more absurd agreed well sir in what is required of me why to work out infamously an action infamously commenced i have consented to communicate this proposition to you although it disgusts me as an honest man ought to feel disgust on such an occasion but now it is your affair if you are guilty choose between a criminal court and the means of ransom offered to you my duty is only an official one and i will not dirty my fingers any further in so foul a transaction the third party is called m petitjean an oil merchant who lives on the banks of the seine quai de billy number ten make your arrangements with him you are fit to meet if you are a forger as he declares m de saint-remy had entered jacques ferrand's study with a lip all scorn and head all pride although he had in his life committed some shameful actions he still retained a certain elevation of race and an instinctive courage which had never forsaken him at the beginning of this conversation considering the notary as an adversary beneath him he had been content to treat him with disdain but when jacques ferrand began to talk of forgery he felt annihilated in his turn he felt himself rode over by the notary but for the entire command of self which he possessed he could not have concealed the terrible impression which this unexpected revelation disclosed to him for it might have incalculable consequences to him consequences unsuspected by the notary himself after a moment of silence and reflection he resigned himself he so haughty so irritable so vain of his self-possession to beg of this coarse man who had so roughly addressed to him the stern language of probity sir you give me proof of your interest for which i thank you and i regret that any hasty expressions should have escaped me said m de saint-remy with a tone of cordiality i do not take the slightest interest in or for you replied the notary brutally your father is the soul of honour and i would not wish that in the depth of that solitude in which he lives as they tell me at angers he should learn that his name has been exposed tarnished degraded in a court of justice that's all i repeat to you sir that i am incapable of the infamy which is attributed to me you may tell that to m petitjean but i confess that in the absence of m smith who has so unworthily abused my confidence that the scoundrel smith the absence of m smith places me in a cruel embarrassment i am innocent let them accuse me i will prove myself guiltless but such an accusation even must always disgrace a gentleman well be so good as to use the sum i have just handed to you in part payment to the person who holds the acceptance that money belongs to a client and is sacred in two or three days i will repay you you will not be able i have resources you have none not visible at least your household furniture your horses do not belong to you as you declare this has to me the appearance of a disgraceful fraud you are severe sir but admitting what you say do not suppose that i shall turn everything into money in such a desperate extremity only as it will be impossible for me to procure between this and noon to-morrow the one hundred thousand francs i entreat you to employ the money i have just handed to you in procuring this unfortunate bill or at least as you are very rich advance the money do not leave me in such a position me why is the man mad sir i beseech you in my father's name which you have mentioned to me be so kind as to i am kind to those who deserve it said the notary harshly an honest man myself i hate swindlers and should not be sorry to see one of those high-minded gentlemen without faith or honour impious and reprobate put in the pillory as an example to others but i hear your horses who are impatient to depart monsieur le vicomte said the notary with a smile that displayed his black fangs at this moment some one knocked at the door of the apartment who's there inquired jacques ferrand madame the comtesse d'orbigny said the chief clerk request her to wait a moment the stepmother of the marchioness d'harville exclaimed m de saint-remy yes sir she has an appointment with me so your servant sir not a word of this sir cried m de saint-remy in a menacing voice i told you sir that a notary is as discreet as a confessor jacques ferrand rang and the clerk appeared show madame d'orbigny in then addressing the viscount 
take these thirteen hundred francs sir they will be something towards an arrangement with monsieur petitjean madame d'orbigny formerly madame roland entered at the moment when m de saint-remy went out his features convulsed with rage at having so uselessly humiliated himself before the notary ah good day m de saint-remy said madame d'orbigny what a time it is since i saw you why madame since derville's marriage at which i was present i do not think i have had the pleasure of meeting you said m de saint-remy bowing and assuming an affable and smiling demeanour you have remained in normandy ever since i think why yes m d'orbigny will only live in the country and what he likes i like so you see in me a complete country wife i have not been in paris since the marriage of my dear stepdaughter with that excellent m d'harville do you see him frequently d'harville has grown very sullen and morose he is seldom seen in the world said m de saint-remy with something like impatience for the conversation was most irksome to him both because of its untimeliness and that the notary seemed amused at it but madame d'harville's stepmother enchanted at thus meeting with the dandy of the first water was not the woman to allow her prey to escape her so easily and my dear stepdaughter she continued she i hope is not as morose as her husband madame d'harville is all the fashion and has the world at her feet as a lovely woman should have it but i take up your time and not at all i assure you it is quite agreeable to me to meet the observed of all observers the monarch of fashion for in ten minutes i shall be as au fait of paris as if i had never left it and your dear m de lucenay who was also present at m d'harville's marriage a still greater oddity he has been travelling in the east and returned in time to receive a sword wound yesterday nothing serious though poor dear duke and his wife always lovely and fascinating madame i have the honour to be one of her profoundest admirers and my testimony would therefore be received with suspicion i beg on your return to aubier you will not forget my regards to m d'orbigny he will i am sure be most sensible of your kindness he often talks of you and says you remind him of the duc de lauzun his comparison is a eulogy in itself but unfortunately infinitely more flattering than true adieu madame for i fear i must not ask to be allowed to pay my respects to you before your departure i should lament to give you the trouble of calling on me for i have pitched my tent for a few days in a furnished hotel but if in the summer or autumn you should be passing our way en route to some of those fashionable chateaux where the leaders of ton dispute the pleasure of receiving you pray give us a few days of your society if it be only by way of contrast and to rest yourself with us poor rustic folk from the whirl of your high life of fashion and distinction for where you are it is always delightful to be madame i need not say how delighted m d'orbigny and myself would be to receive you but adieu sir i fear the kind attorney she pointed to ferrand will grow impatient at our gossip quite the reverse madame quite the reverse said ferrand with an emphasis that redoubled the repressed rage of m de saint-remy is not m ferrand a terrible man said madame d'orbigny affectedly mind now i tell you that if he has charge of your affairs he will scold you awfully he is the most unpitying man but that's my nonsense on the contrary why such an exquisite as you as to have m ferrand for his solicitor is a proof of reformation for we know very well that he never allows his clients to do foolish things if they do he gives up their business oh he will not be everybody's lawyer then turning to jacques ferrand do you know most puritanical solicitor that you have made a splendid conversion there if you reform the exquisite of exquisites the king of the mud it is really a conversion madame the viscount left my study a very different man from what he entered it there i tell you that you perform miracles ah madame you flatter me said jacques ferrand with emphasis m de saint-remy made a low bow to madame d'orbigny and then as he left the notary desirous of trying once more to excite his pity he said to him in a careless tone which however betrayed deep anxiety then my dear m ferrand you will not grant me the favour i ask some wild scheme no doubt be inexorable my dear puritan cried madame d'orbigny laughing you hear sir i must not contradict such a handsome lady my dear m ferrand 
let us speak seriously of serious things and you know this is a most serious matter do you really refuse me inquired the viscount with an anxiety which he could not altogether dissemble the notary was cruel enough to appear to hesitate m de saint-remy had an instant hope what man of iron do you yield said madame d'harville's stepmother laughing still do you too yield to the charm of the irresistible ma foi madame i was on the point of yielding as you say but you make me blush for my weakness added m ferrand and then addressing himself to the viscount he said to him with an accent of which saint-remy felt all the meaning well then seriously and he dwelt on the word it is impossible ah the puritan hark to the puritan said madame d'orbigny see si, monsieur petit-jean he will think precisely as i do i am sure and like me will say to you no monsieur de saint-remy rushed out in despair after a moment's reflection he said to himself it must be so then he added addressing his chasseur who was standing with the door of his carriage opened to the hotel de lucenay whilst m de saint-remy is on his way to see the duchess we will present the reader at the interview between m ferrand and the stepmother of madame d'harville end of chapter four read by celine major chapter five part one of the mysteries of paris volume three this librivox recording is in the public domain recorded by celine major the mysteries of paris volume three by eugene sue chapter five part one the clients the reader may have forgotten the portrait of the stepmother of madame d'harville as drawn by the latter let us then repeat that madame d'orbigny was a slight fair delicate woman with eyelashes almost white round and palish blue eyes with a soft voice a hypocritical air insidious and insinuating manners any one who studied her treacherous and perfidious countenance would detect therein craft and cruelty what a delightful young man m de saint-remy is said madame d'orbigny to jacques ferrand when the viscount had left them delightful but madame let us now proceed to our business you wrote to me from normandy that you desired to consult me upon most serious matters have you not always been my adviser ever since the worthy dr polidori introduced me to you by the way have you heard from him recently inquired madame d'orbigny with an air of complete carelessness since he left paris he has not written me a single line replied the notary with an air of similar indifference let the reader understand that these two persons lied most unequivocally to each other the notary had seen polidori one of his two accomplices recently and had proposed to him to go to asnières to the martial the fresh-water pirates of whom we shall presently speak had proposed to him we say to poison louise morel under the name of dr vincent madame d'harville's stepmother on her side had come to paris in order to have a secret meeting with this scoundrel who had been for a long time concealed and as we have said under the name of cesar bradamanti but it is not the good doctor of whom we have to discourse continued madame d'harville's stepmother you see me very uneasy my husband is indisposed his health becomes weaker and weaker every day without experiencing serious alarm his condition gives me much concern or rather gives him much concern said madame d'orbigny drying her eyes which were slightly moistened what is the business madame he is constantly talking of making his last arrangements of his will here madame d'orbigny concealed her face in her pocket-handkerchief for some minutes it is very afflicting no doubt said the notary but the precaution has nothing terrible in itself and what may be m d'orbigny's intentions madame dear sir how do i know you may suppose that when he commences a subject i do not allow him to dwell on it long well then he has not up to this time told you anything positive i think replied madame d'orbigny with a deep sigh ah, i think he wishes to leave me not only all that the law will allow him to bequeath me but but really i pray of you do not let us talk of that of what then shall we talk alas you are right pitiless man 
i must in spite of myself return to the sad subject that brings me here to see you well then m d'orbigny's inclination extends so far that he desires to sell a part of his estate and present me with a large sum but his daughter his daughter exclaimed m ferrand harshly i must tell you that during the last year m d'harville has placed his affairs in my hands and i have lately purchased a splendid estate for him you know my blunt way of doing business whether m d'harville is my client or not is no matter i stand up only for justice if your husband makes up his mind to behave to his daughter in a way that i do not approve i tell you plainly he must not reckon on my assistance upright and downright such has always been my line of conduct and mine also therefore it is that i am always saying to my husband what you now say to me your daughter has behaved very ill to you that is but too true but that is no reason why you should disinherit her very good quite right and what answer does he make to that he replies i shall leave my daughter twenty five thousand francs of annual income one thousand livres she had more than a million forty thousand livres from her mother her husband has an enormous fortune of his own and therefore why should i not leave you the residue of my fortune you my tender love the sole support the only comfort of my declining years my guardian angel i repeat these very flattering words to you said madame d'orbigny with an air of modesty to prove to you how kind m d'orbigny is to me but in spite of that i have always refused his offers and as he perceives that he has compelled me to come and seek you but i do not know m d'orbigny but he like all the world knows your high character but why should he send you to me to put an end to all my scruples and refusals he said to me i will not ask you to consult my notary because you will think him too much devoted to my service but i will trust myself entirely to the decision of a man of whose extreme probity of character i have heard you so frequently speak in praise m jacques ferrand if he considers your delicacy compromised by your consent to my wishes we will not say another word on the subject otherwise you must comply without a word i consent i replied to m d'orbigny and so now you are the arbitrator between us if m ferrand approves added my husband i will send him ample power to realize in my name my rents and investments and he shall keep the proceeds in his hands as a deposit and thus after my decease my tender love you will at least have an existence worthy of you perhaps m ferrand never had greater need of his spectacles than at this moment for had he not worn them madame d'orbigny would doubtless have been struck with the sparkle of the notary's eyes which seemed to dart fire when the word deposit was pronounced however he replied in his usual coarse way it is very tiresome this is the tenth or twelfth time that i have been made the arbitrator in a similar matter always under the pretence of my honesty that is the only word in people's mouths my honesty my honesty what a fine quality forsooth which only brings me in a great deal of tiresome trouble my good m ferrand come do not repulse me you will write at once to m d'orbigny who only awaits your letter to send you full powers to act for him and to realize the sum required which amounts to how much why i think he said four or five hundred thousand francs sixteen thousand or twenty thousand livres the sum after all is not so much as i thought you are devoted to m d'orbigny his daughter is very rich you have nothing that is not just and i really think you should accept it really do you think so indeed said madame d'orbigny who was the dupe like the rest of the world of the proverbial probity of the notary and who had not been enlightened by polidori in this particular you may accept he repeated i will accept then said madame d'orbigny with a sigh the chief clerk knocked at the door who is there inquired m ferrand madame the countess macgregor request her to wait a moment i will go then my dear monsieur ferrand said madame d'orbigny you will write to my husband since he wishes it and he will send you the requisite authority by return of post i will write adieu my worthy and excellent counsellor ah you do not know you people of the world how disagreeable it is to take charge of such deposits 
the responsibility which we then assume i tell you that there is nothing more detestable in the world than this fine character for probity which brings down upon one all these turmoils and troubles and the admiration of all good people thank heaven i place otherwise than here below the hopes of the reward at which i aim said m ferrand in a hypocritical tone to madame d'orbigny succeeded sarah macgregor sarah entered the cabinet of the notary with her usual coolness and assurance jacques ferrand did not know her nor the motives of her visit and he therefore scrutinized her carefully in the hope of catching another dupe he looked most attentively at the countess and despite the imperturbability of this marble-fronted woman he observed a slight working of the eyebrows which betrayed a repressed embarrassment the notary rose from his seat handed a chair and motioning to sarah to sit down thus accosted her you have requested of me madame an interview for to-day i was very much engaged yesterday and could not reply until this morning i beg you will accept my apology for the delay i was desirous of seeing you sir on a matter of the greatest importance your reputation for honesty kindness and complaisance has made me hope that the step i have taken with you will be successful the notary bent forward slightly in his chair i know sir that your discretion is perfect it is my duty madame you are sir a man of rigid moral and incorruptible character yes madame yet sir if you were told that it depended on you to restore life more than life reason to an unhappy mother should you have the courage to refuse her if you will state the circumstances madame i shall be better able to reply it is fourteen years since at the end of the month of december eighteen twenty four a man in the prime of life and dressed in deep mourning came to ask you to take away by way of life annuity the sum of a hundred and fifty thousand francs six thousand livres which it was desired should be sunk in favour of a child of three years of age whose parents were desirous of remaining unknown well madame said the notary careful not to reply in the affirmative you assented and took charge of this sum agreeing to insure the child a yearly pension of eight thousand francs three hundred twenty livres half this income was to accumulate for the child's benefit until of age the other half was to be paid by you to the person who took care of this little girl well madame at the end of two years said sarah unable to repress a slight emotion on the twenty eighth of november eighteen twenty seven the child died before we proceed any farther madame with this conversation i must know what interest you take in this matter the mother of this little girl sir was my sister note two i have here proofs of what i advance the declaration of the poor child's death the letters of the person who took charge of her and the acknowledgment of one of your clients with whom you have placed the hundred and fifty thousand francs note two it is perhaps unnecessary to remind the reader that the child in question is fleur de marie daughter of rodolph and sarah and that the latter in speaking of a pretended sister tells a falsehood necessary for her plans as will be seen sarah was convinced as was rodolph also of the death of the little girl allow me to see those papers madame somewhat astonished at not being believed on her word sarah drew from a pocket-book several papers which the notary examined with great attention well madame what do you desire the declaration of decease is perfectly in order the hundred and fifty thousand francs came to my client m petitjean on the death of the child it is one of the chances of life annuities as i remarked to the person who placed the affair in my hands as to the pension it was duly paid by me up to the time of the child's decease i am ready to declare sir that nothing could be more satisfactory than your conduct throughout the whole of the affair the female who had charge of the child is also entitled to our gratitude for she took the greatest care of my poor little niece true madame and i was so much satisfied with her conduct that seeing her out of place after the death of the child i took her into my employment and since that time she has remained with me is madame seraphin in your service sir she has been my housekeeper these fourteen years and i must ever speak in her praise since that is the case sir she may be of the greatest use to us if you will kindly grant me a request which may appear strange perhaps even culpable at first sight 
but when you know the motive a culpable request madame is what i cannot believe you capable of addressing to me sir i am acquainted with the rectitude of your principles but all my hope my only hope is in your pity under any event i may rely on your discretion madame you may well then i will proceed the death of this poor child was so great a shock to her mother that her grief is as great now as it was fourteen years since and having then feared for her life we are now in dread for her reason poor mother said m ferrand in a tone of sympathy oh yes poor unhappy mother indeed sir for she could only blush at the birth of her child at the time when she lost it whilst now circumstances are such that if the child were still alive my sister could render her legitimate be proud of her and never again allow her to quit her thus this incessant regret coming to add to her other sorrows we are afraid every hour lest she should be bereft of her senses it is unfortunate that nothing can be done in the matter yes sir what madame suppose some one told the poor mother your child was reported to be dead but she did not die the woman who had charge of her when she was little could vouch for this such a falsehood madame would be cruel why give so vain a hope to the poor mother but supposing it were not a falsehood sir or rather if the supposition could be realized by a miracle if it only required my prayers to be united with your own to obtain this result i would give them to you from the bottom of my heart believe me madame unfortunately the register of decease is strictly regular oh yes sir i know well enough that the child is dead and yet if you will agree that misfortune need not be irreparable is this some riddle madame i will speak more clearly if my sister were to-morrow to recover her daughter she would be certain not only to be restored to health but to be wedded to the father of her child who is now as free as herself my niece died at six years old separated from her parents from a very tender age they have not the slightest recollection of her suppose a young girl of seventeen was produced my niece would be about that age a young girl such as there are many forsaken by her parents and it was said to my sister here is your daughter for you have been imposed upon important interests have required that she should have been said to be dead the female who brought her up and a respectable notary will confirm these facts and prove to you that it is really she jacques ferrand after having allowed the countess to speak on without interruption rose abruptly and exclaimed with an indignant air madame this is infamous sir to dare to propose such a thing to me to me a supposititious child the destruction of a registry of decease a criminal act indeed it is the first time in my life that i was ever subjected to so outrageous a proposal a proposal i have not merited and you know it but sir what wrong does this do to any one my sister and the individual she desires to marry are widow and widower and childless both bitterly lamenting the child they have lost to deceive them is to restore them to happiness to life is to ensure a happy destiny to some poor forsaken girl and it becomes therefore a noble a generous action and not a crime really madame i marvel to see how the most execrable projects may be coloured so as to pass for beautiful pictures but sir reflect i repeat to you madame that it is infamous and it is shameful to see a lady of your rank lend herself to such abominable machinations to which i trust your sister is a stranger sir enough madame enough i am not a polished gentleman i am not and i shall speak my mind bluntly sarah gave the notary a piercing look with her jet-black eyes and said coldly you refuse i pray madame that you will not again insult me beware what threats threats and that you may learn they are not vain ones learn first that i have no sister what madame i am the mother of this child you i i made a circuitous route to reach my end coined a tale to excite your interest but you are pitiless i raise the mask you are for war well 
war be it then war because i refuse to associate myself with you in a criminal machination what audacity listen to me sir your reputation as an honest man is established acknowledged undisputed because deserved and therefore you must have lost your reason to make such a proposal as you have done and then threaten me because i will not accede to it i know sir better than any one how much reputations for immaculate virtue are to be distrusted they often mask wantonness in women and roguery in men madame ever since our conversation began i do not know why but i have mistrusted your claim to the esteem and consideration which you enjoy really madame your mistrust does honour to your penetration does it not for this mistrust is based on mere nothings on instinct on inexplicable presentiments but these intimations have rarely beguiled me madame let us terminate this conversation first learn my determination i begin by telling you that i am convinced of the death of my poor daughter but no matter i shall pretend that she is not dead the most unlikely things do happen you are at this moment in a position of which very many must be envious and would be delighted at any weapon with which to assail you i will supply one you i by attacking you under some absurd pretext some irregularity in the declaration of death say no matter what i will insist that my child is not dead as i have the greatest interest in making it believe that she is still alive though lost this action will be useful to me in giving a wide circulation to the affair a mother who claims her child is always interesting and i should have with me those who envy you your enemies and every sensitive and romantic mind this is as mad as it is malevolent what motive could i have in making your daughter pass for dead if she were not really defunct that is true enough and the motive may be difficult to find but then have we not the attorneys and barristers at our elbows now i think of it excellent idea desirous of sharing with your client the sum sunk in the annuity on this unfortunate child you caused her disappearance the unabashed notary shrugged his shoulders if i had been criminal enough for that instead of causing its disappearance i should have killed it sarah started with surprise remained silent for a moment and then said with bitterness for a pious man this is an idea of crime deeply reflective can i by chance then have hit the mark when i fired at random i must think of this and think i will one other word you see the sort of woman i am i crush without remorse all obstacles that lie in my onward path reflect well then for to-morrow this must be decided on you may do what i ask you with impunity in his joy the father of my daughter will not think of doubting the possibility of his child's restoration if our falsehoods which will make him happy are adroitly combined besides he has no other proofs of the death of our daughter than those i wrote to him of fourteen years ago and i could easily persuade him that i had deceived him on this subject for then i had real causes of complaint against him i will tell him that in my grief i was desirous of breaking every existing tie that bound us to each other you cannot therefore be compromised in any way affirm only irreproachable man affirm that all was in former days concerted between us you and me and madame seraphin and you will be credited as to the fifteen thousand francs sunk in an annuity for my child that is my affair solely they will remain acquired by your client who must be kept profoundly ignorant of this and moreover you shall yourself name your own recompense jacques ferrand maintained all his sang-froid in spite of the singularity of his situation remarkable and dangerous as it was the countess really believing in the death of her daughter had proposed to the notary to pass off the dead child as living whom living he had declared to have died fourteen years before he was too clever and too well acquainted with the perils of his position not to understand the effect of all sarah's threats his reputation although admirably and laboriously built up was based on a substructure of sand the public detaches itself as easily as it becomes infatuated liking to have the right to trample under foot him whom but just now it elevated to the skies how could the consequences of the first assault on the reputation of jacques ferrand be foreseen 
however absurd the attack might be its very boldness might give rise to suspicions wishing to gain time to determine on the mode by which he would seek to parry the dangerous blow the notary said frigidly to sarah you have given me madame until to-morrow at noon i give you until the next day to renounce a plot whose serious nature you do not seem to have contemplated if between this and then i do not receive from you a letter informing me that you have abandoned this criminal and crazy enterprise you will learn to your cost that justice knows how to protect honest people who refuse guilty associations and what may happen to the concoctors of hateful machinations you mean to say sir that you ask from me one more day to reflect on my proposals that is a good sign and i grant the delay the day after to-morrow at this hour i will come here again and it shall be between us peace or war i repeat it but a war to the knife without mercy or pity and sarah left the room all goes well she said this miserable girl in whom rodolph capriciously takes so much interest and has sent to the farm at bouqueval in order no doubt to make her his mistress hereafter is no longer to be feared thanks to the one-eyed woman who has freed me from her rodolph's adroitness has saved madame d'harville from the snare into which i meant she should fall but it is impossible that she can escape from the fresh plot i have laid for her and thus she must be for ever lost to rodolph thus saddened discouraged isolated from all affection will he not be in a frame of mind such as will best suit my purpose of making him the dupe of a falsehood to which by the notary's aid i can give every impress of truth and the notary will aid me for i have frightened him i shall easily find a young orphan girl interesting and poor who taught her lesson by me will fill the character of our child so bitterly mourned by rodolph i know the expansiveness the generosity of his heart yes to give a name a rank to her whom he will believe to be his daughter till now forsaken and abandoned he will renew those bonds between us which i believed indissoluble the predictions of my nurse will be at length realized and i shall thus and then attain the constant aim of my life a crown End of chapter five part one read by celine major chapter five part two of the mysteries of paris volume three this librivox recording is in the public domain recorded by celine major the mysteries of paris volume three by eugene sue chapter five part two the clients sarah had scarcely left the notary before m charles robert entered after alighting from a very dashing cabriolet he went like a person on most intimate terms to the private room of jacques ferrand the commandant as madame pipelet called him entered without ceremony into the notary's cabinet whom he found in a surly bilious mood and who thus accosted him i reserve the afternoon for my clients when you wish to speak to me come in the morning will you my dear lawyer this was a standing pleasantry of m robert i have a very important matter to talk about in the first place and in the next i was anxious to assure you in person against any alarms you may have what alarms what haven't you heard what of my duel your duel with the duc de lucenay is it possible you have not heard of it quite possible pooh pooh but what did you fight about a very serious matter which called for bloodshed only imagine that at a very large party m de lucenay actually said that i had a phlegmy cough that you had a phlegmy cough my dear lawyer a complaint which is really most ridiculously absurd and did you fight about that what the devil would you have a man fight about can you imagine that a man could stand calmly and hear himself charged with having a phlegmy cough and before a lovely woman too before a little marchioness who who in a word i could not stand it really the military men you see are always sensitive my seconds went the day before yesterday to try and obtain some explanation from those of the duke i put the matter perfectly straight 
a duel or an ample apology an ample apology for what for the phlegmy cough pardieu the phlegmy cough that he fastened on me the notary shrugged his shoulders the duke second said we bear testimony to the honourable character of m charles robert but m de lucenay cannot ought not and will not retract then gentlemen replied my seconds m de lucenay is obstinately determined to assert that m charles robert has a phlegmy cough yes gentlemen but he does not therefore mean in the slightest way to impugn the high respectability of m charles robert then let him retract no gentlemen m de lucenay acknowledges m robert as a most decidedly worthy gentleman but still asserts that he has a phlegmy cough you see there was no means of arranging so serious an affair to be sure not you were insulted in the point which a man holds dearest wasn't i well time and place were agreed on and yesterday morning we met at vincennes and everything passed off in the most honourable manner possible i touched m de lucenay slightly in the arm and the seconds declared that honour was satisfied then the duke with a loud voice said i never retract before a meeting but afterwards it is a very different thing it is therefore my duty and my honour impels me to declare that i falsely accused m charles robert of having a phlegmy cough gentlemen i not only declare that my honourable opponent had not a phlegmy cough but i trust he never will have one then the duke extended his hand in the most cordial manner saying are you now satisfied we are friends through life and death i replied and it was really due to him to say so the duke has behaved to perfection either he might have said nothing or contented himself with declaring that i had not the phlegmy cough but to express his wish that i might never have it was a most delicate attention on his part this is what i call courage well employed but what do you want my dear cash-keeper this was another of m robert's habitual pleasantries it is a matter of great importance to me you know that according to our agreement i have advanced to you three hundred and fifty thousand francs fourteen thousand livres to complete a particular payment you had and it was stipulated that i was to give you three months notice of my wish to withdraw that money the interest of which you pay me regularly go on well said m robert hesitatingly i no that is what why it is only a whim of becoming a landed proprietor come to the point pray you annoy me in a word then i am anxious to become a landed proprietor and if not inconvenient to you i should like that is i should wish to have my funds now in your hands and i came to say so aha that does not offend you i hope why should i be offended because you might think i might think that i am the echo of certain reports what reports oh nothing mere folly but tell me oh there can be no certainty in the gossip about you what gossip oh it is false from beginning to end but there are chatterers who say that you are mixed up in some unpleasant transactions idle gossip i am quite certain it is just the same as the report that you and i speculated on the exchange together these reports soon died away for i will always say that so you suppose that your money is not safe with me oh no no but at this moment i should like to have it in my own hands wait a moment m ferrand shut the drawer of his bureau and rose where are you going my dear cash-keeper to fetch what will convince you of the truth of the reports as to the embarrassment of my affairs said the notary ironically and opening the door of a small private staircase which enabled him to go into the pavilion at the back without passing through the office he disappeared he had scarce left the room when the head clerk rapped again come in said charles robert 
is not m ferrand here no my worthy pounce and parchment another joke of m robert there is a lady with a veil on who wishes to see my employer this moment on a very urgent affair worthy quill driver the excellent employer will be here in a moment and i will inform him is the lady handsome one must be very keen-sighted to discover for she has on a black veil so thick that it is impossible to see her face really really i will make her show her face as i go out i'll tell the governor as soon as he returns the clerk left the room where the devil has the attorney at law vanished said m charles robert to examine the state of his finances no doubt if these reports are groundless so much the better and when all is said and done they can but be false reports men of jacques ferrand's honesty always have so many people jealous of them still at the same time i should just as well like to have my own cash i will certainly buy the chateau in question there are towers and gothic turrets quite a la louis XIV, the real renaissance and in a word all that is most rococo it would give me a kind of landed proprietor's sort of air which would be capital it would not be like my amour with that flirt of a madame d'harville has she really cut me can she really have given me the go-by no no i am not trifled with as that stupid porteress in the rue du temple with her bob wig says yet this agreeable little flirtation has cost me at least one thousand crowns true the furniture is left and i have quite enough in my power to compromise the marchioness but here comes the lawyer m ferrand returned holding in his hand some papers which he handed to m charles robert here said he are three hundred and fifty thousand francs in bank bills in a few days we will balance the account of interest give me a receipt what exclaimed m robert astonished do not go to think that i don't think anything but the receipt dear cash-keeper write it and tell the persons who talk to you of my embarrassments how i reply to such suspicions the fact is that as soon as they hear this your credit will be more solid than ever but really take the money back again i do not want it at this moment i told you it was three months hence monsieur charles robert no man suspects me twice you are angry the receipt the receipt man of iron that you are said m charles robert there he added writing the receipt there is a lady closely veiled who desires to speak to you directly on a very urgent affair won't i have a good look at her as i go out there's your receipt is it all right quite now i'll thank you to go out this way and so not see the lady precisely so and the notary rang and when the chief clerk made his appearance he said ask the lady to walk in good day monsieur robert well i see i must give up the chance of seeing her don't bear malice lawyer believe me if there there that'll do good-bye and the notary shut the door on m charles robert after the lapse of a few moments the chief clerk introduced the duchess de lucenay very simply attired wearing a large shawl and her features entirely concealed by a thick veil of black lace depending from her watered silk bonnet of the same colour madame de lucenay a good deal agitated walked slowly towards the notary's bureau who advanced a few paces to meet her who are you madame and what may be your business with me said jacques ferrand abruptly for sarah's menaces and m charles robert's suspicions had a good deal ruffled him moreover the duchess was clad so simply that the notary did not see any reason why he should not be rude as she did not immediately reply he continued abruptly will you be so kind as to inform me madame sir she said in a faltering voice and endeavouring to conceal her face in the folds of her veil sir may i entrust you with a secret of extreme importance you may trust me with anything madame but it is requisite that i should know and see to whom i speak that sir perhaps is not necessary 
i know that you are probity and honour itself to the point madame to the point i have some one waiting for me who are you my name is of no consequence sir one of my friends a relative has just left you his name monsieur florestan de saint-remy ah said the notary and he cast a scrutinizing and steadfast glance on the duchess then he added well madame monsieur de saint-remy has told me all sir what has he told you madame all what all sir you know i know many things about monsieur de saint-remy alas sir this is a terrible thing i know many terrible things about monsieur de saint-remy oh sir he was right when he told me that you were pitiless for swindlers and forgers like him yes i am pitiless so this saint-remy is a relative of yours instead of owning it you ought to blush at it do you mean to try and soften me with your tears it is useless not to add that you have undertaken a very disgraceful task for a respectable female at this coarse insolence the pride and patrician blood of the duchess revolted she drew herself up threw back her veil and then with a lofty air imperious glance and firm voice said i am the duchesse de lucenay sir the lady then assumed the lofty look of her station and her appearance was so imposing that the notary controlled fascinated receded a pace quite overcome took off mechanically the black silk cap that covered his cranium and made a low bow in truth nothing could be more charming and aristocratic than the face and figure of madame de lucenay although she was turned thirty and her features were pale and somewhat agitated but then she had full brown eyes sparkling and bold splendid black hair a nose thin and arched a lip red and disdainful a dazzling complexion teeth of ivory and a form tall and slender graceful and full of distinction the carriage of a goddess in the clouds as the immortal saint simon says with her hair powdered and a costume of the eighteenth century madame de lucenay would have represented physically and morally one of those gay and careless duchesses of the regency who carried on their flirtations or worse with so much audacity giddiness and real kindness of heart who confessed their peccadilloes from time to time with so much candour and naivete that the most punctilious said with a smile she is doubtless light and culpable but she is so kind so delightful loves with so much intensity passion and fidelity as long as she does love that we cannot really be angry with her after all she only injures herself and makes so many others happy except the powder and the large skirts to her dress such also was madame de lucenay when not depressed by sombre thoughts she entered the office of m jacques ferrand like a plain tradesman's wife in the instant she came forth as a great proud and irritated lady jacques ferrand had never in his life seen a woman of such striking beauty so haughty and bold and so noble in her demeanour the look of the duchess her glorious eyes encircled with an imperceptible bow of azure her rosy nostrils much dilated betokened her ardent nature although old ugly ignoble and sordid jacques ferrand was as capable as any one of appreciating the style of beauty of madame de lucenay the hatred and rage which the notary felt against m de saint-remy was increased by the admiration which his proud and lovely mistress inspired in him devoured by all his repressed passions he said to himself in an agony of rage that this gentleman forger whom he had compelled almost to fall at his feet when he threatened him with the assizes could inspire such love in such a woman that she actually risked the present step in his behalf which might prove fatal to her reputation as he thus thought the notary felt his boldness which had been for a moment paralyzed restored to him hatred envy a kind of savage and burning resentment lighted up his eyes his forehead and his cheeks seeing madame de lucenay on the point of commencing so delicate a conversation he expected from her caution and management what was his astonishment she spoke with as much assurance and haughtiness as if she were discoursing about the simplest thing in the world and as if before a man of his sort 
she had no care for reserve or those concealments which she would assuredly have maintained with her equals in fact the coarse brutality of the notary wounded her to the quick and had led madame de lucenay to quit the humble and supplicating part she was acting with much difficulty to herself returned to herself she thought it beneath her to descend to the least concealment with a mere scribbler of acts and deeds high-spirited charitable generous overflowing with kindness warm-heartedness and energy in spite of her faults but the daughter of a mother of no principle and who had even disgraced the noble and respectable though fallen position of an emigre madame de lucenay in her inborn contempt for certain classes would have said with the roman empress who took her bath in the presence of a male slave he is not a man monsieur notary said the duchess with a determined air to jacques ferrand monsieur de saint-remy is one of my friends and has confided to me the embarrassment under which he is at this moment suffering from a twofold treachery of which he is the victim all is arranged as to the money how much is required to terminate these miserable annoyances jacques ferrand was actually aghast at this cavalier and deliberate manner of entering on this affair one hundred thousand francs are required he repeated after having in some degree surmounted his surprise you shall have your one hundred thousand francs so send at once these annoying papers to monsieur de saint-remy where are the one hundred thousand francs madame la duchesse have i not said you should have them sir i must have them to-morrow and before noon madame or else proceedings will be instantly commenced for the forgery well do you pay this sum which i will repay you but madame it is impossible but sir you will not tell me i imagine that a notary like you cannot find one hundred thousand francs by to-morrow morning on what securities madame what do you mean explain who will be answerable to me for this sum i will still madame need i say that i have an estate four leagues from paris which brings me in eighty thousand francs three thousand two hundred livres a year that will suffice i should think for what you call your securities yes madame when the mortgage is properly secured what do you mean some formality of law no doubt do it sir do it such a deed cannot be drawn up in less than a fortnight and we must have your husband's assent madame but the estate is mine and mine only said the duchess impatiently no matter madame you have a husband and mortgage deeds are very long and very minute but once again sir you will not ask me to believe that it is so difficult to find one hundred thousand francs in two hours then madame apply to the notary you usually employ or your steward as for me it is impossible i have my reasons for keeping this secret said madame de lucenay haughtily you know the rogues who seek to take advantage of monsieur de saint-remy and that is the reason why i address myself to you your confidence does me much honour madame but i cannot do what you ask of me you have not this sum i have much more than that sum in banknotes or bright and good gold here in my chest then why waste time about it you require my signature i suppose well let me give it to you and let us end the matter even admitting madame that you were madame de lucenay come to the hotel de lucenay in one hour sir and i will sign whatever may be requisite and will the duke sign also i do not understand sir your signature alone would be worthless to me madame jacques ferrand delighted with cruel joy in the manifest impatience of the duchess who under the appearance of coolness and hauteur repressed really painful agony for an instant she was at her wit's end on the previous evening her jeweller had advanced her a considerable sum on her jewels some of which had been confided to morel the lapidary this sum had been employed in paying the bills of m de saint-remy and thus disarming the other creditors m dubreuil the farmer of arnouville was more than a year's rent in advance on the farm and then the time was so pressing still more unfortunately for madame de lucenay two of her friends to whom she could have had recourse in this moment of distress were then absent from paris 
in her eyes the viscount was innocent of the forgery he had said and she had believed him that he was the victim of two rogues and yet his position was not the less terrible he accused he led to prison and even if he took flight his name would be no less dishonoured by the suspicion that would light on him at these distressing thoughts madame de lucenay trembled with affright she blindly loved this man at the same time so degraded and gifted with such strong seductive powers and her passion for him was one of those affections which women of her character and her temperament ordinarily experience when they attain an age of maturity jacques ferrand carefully watched every variation in the physiognomy of madame de lucenay who seemed to him more lovely and attractive at every moment and awakened still more his ardent feeling yet he felt a fierce pleasure in tormenting by his refusals this female who could only entertain disgust and contempt from him the lady had spurned the idea of saying a word to the notary that might seem like a supplication yet when she found the uselessness of other attempts which she had addressed to him alone could save m de saint-remy she said at length trying to repress all evidence of emotion since you have the sum of money which i ask of you sir and my guarantee is sufficient why do you refuse it to me because men have their caprices as well as ladies madame well what is this caprice which thus impels you to act against your own interest for i repeat sir that whatever may be your conditions i accept them you will accept all my conditions madame said the notary with a singular expression all two three four thousand francs more if you please for you must know sir added the duchess in a tone almost confidential i have no resource but in you sir and in you only it will be impossible for me at this moment to find elsewhere what i require for to-morrow and i must have it as you know i must absolutely have it thus i repeat to you that whatever terms you require for this service i accept them nothing will be a sacrifice to me nothing the breath of the notary became thick and in his ignoble blindness he interpreted the last words of madame de lucenay in an unworthy manner he saw through his darkened understanding a woman as bold as some of the females of the old court a woman driven to her wit's end for fear of the dishonour of him whom she loved and capable perhaps of any sacrifice to save him it was even more stupid than infamous to think so but as we have said already jacques ferrand sometimes though rarely forgot himself he quitted his chair abruptly and approached madame de lucenay who surprised rose when he did and looked at him with much astonishment nothing will be a sacrifice to you say you to you who are so lovely he exclaimed with a voice trembling and broken with agitation as he went towards the duchess well then i will lend you this sum on one condition one condition only and i swear to you he could not finish his declaration by one of those singular contradictions of human nature at the sight of the singularly ugly features of m ferrand at the strange and whimsical thoughts which arose in madame de lucenay's mind at his ridiculous pretensions which she guessed in spite of her disquietude and anxiety she burst into a fit of laughter so hearty so loud and so excessive that the disconcerted notary reeled back then without allowing him a moment to utter another word the duchess gave way still more to her increasing mirth lowered her veil and between two bursts of irrepressible laughter she said to the notary overwhelmed by hatred rage and fury really i should much rather prefer asking this advance from m de lucenay she then left the room laughing so heartily that even when the door of his room was closed the notary heard her still jacques ferrand no sooner recovered his reason than he cursed his imprudence but he became reassured on reflecting that the duchess could not allude to this adventure without compromising herself still the day had been unpropitious and he was plunged in thought when the door of his study opened and madame seraphin entered in great agitation ah ferrand she exclaimed you are right when you declared that one day or other we should be ruined for having allowed her to live who that cursed little girl what do you mean a one-eyed woman whom i did not know and to whom tournemine gave the little chit to get rid of her fourteen years ago when we wished to make her pass for dead ah who would have thought of it 
speak speak why don't you speak this one-eyed woman has been here was downstairs just now and told me that she knew it was i who had delivered up the little brat malediction who could have told her tournament is at the galleys i denied it and treated the one-eyed woman as a liar but bah she declares she knows where the girl is now and that she has grown up that she has her and that it only depends on her to discover everything is hell then unchained against me to-day exclaimed the notary in a fit of rage what shall i say to this woman what shall i offer her to hold her tongue does she seem well off as i treated her like a beggar she shook her hand-basket and there was money inside of it and she knows where this young girl is now so she says and she is the daughter of the countess sarah macgregor said the stupefied notary and just now she offered me so much to declare that her daughter was not dead and the girl is alive and i can restore her to her mother but then the false register of her death if a search were made i am ruined this crime may put others on the scent after a moment's silence he said to madame seraphin this one-eyed woman knows where the child is yes and the woman will call again to-morrow write to polidori to come to me this evening at nine o'clock what would you rid yourself of the young girl and the old woman too ferrand that will be too much at once i bid you to write to polidori to come here this evening at nine o'clock at the end of this day rodolph said to murphy desire m de gruen to dispatch a courier this instant cecily must be in paris in six days what that she devil again the diabolical wife of poor david as beautiful as she is infamous for what purpose monseigneur for what purpose sir walter murphy ask that question in a month hence of the notary jacques ferrand End of chapter five read by celine major Chapter Six, Part One of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume Three. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Céline Major. The Mysteries of Paris, Volume Three by Eugène Sue. Chapter Six, Part One, The Anonymous Letter. Towards ten o'clock in the evening of the same day, in which Fleur de Marie was carried off by the Chouette and schoolmaster, a man on horseback arrived at the Bouqueval farm representing himself as coming from m rodolphe to tranquillize madame georges as to the safety of her young friend and to assure her of her safe return ere long the man further stated that m rodolphe having very important reasons for making the request particularly desired no letters might be addressed to him at paris for the present but that in the event of madame georges having anything particular to communicate the messenger now sent would take charge of it and deliver it punctually this pretended envoy on the part of rodolph was in fact an emissary sent by sarah who by this stratagem effected the twofold purpose of quieting the apprehensions of madame georges and also obtaining a delay of several days ere rodolph learned that the goualeuse had been carried off during which interval sarah hoped to have induced the notary jacques ferrand to promote her unworthy attempt to impose a supposititious child on rodolph after the manner which has already been related nor was this all the evil planned by the countess she ardently desired to get rid of madame d'harville on whose account she entertained very serious misgivings and whose destruction she had so nearly compassed but for the timely interposition of rodolph on the day following that in which the marquis followed his wife into the house in the rue du temple tom repaired thither and by skilfully drawing madame pupin to conversation contrived to learn from her how a young and elegantly dressed lady upon the point of being surprised by her husband had been preserved through the presence of mind and cleverness of a lodger in the house named m rodolph once informed of this circumstance and possessing no positive proof of the assignation made by clemence with m charles robert sarah conceived a plan evidently more hateful than the former she resolved to dispatch a second anonymous letter to m d'harville calculated to bring about a complete rupture between himself and rodolph or failing that to infuse into the mind of the marquis suspicions so unworthy of his wife and friend as should induce him to forbid madame d'harville ever admitting the prince into her society this black and malignant epistle was couched in the following terms 
you have been grossly deceived the other day your wife being apprised of your following her invented a tale of imaginary beneficence the real purpose of her visit to the rue du temple was to fulfil an assignation with an august personage who has hired a room on the fourth floor in the house situated rue du temple this illustrious individual being known only at his lodging under the simple name of rodolph should you doubt these facts which may probably appear to you too improbable to deserve credit go to number seventeen rue du temple and make due inquiries obtain a description of the face and figure of the august personage alluded to and you will be compelled to own yourself the most credulous and easily duped husband that was ever so royally supplanted in the affections of his wife despise not this advice if you would not have the world believe you carry your devotion to your prince rather too far this infamous concoction was put into the post by sarah herself about five o'clock in the afternoon of the day which had witnessed her interview with the notary on this same day after having given renewed directions to m de graun to expedite the arrival of cecily in paris by every means in his power rodolph prepared to pass the evening with the ambassadress of blank and on his return to call on madame d'harville for the purpose of informing her he had found a charitable intrigue worthy even of her cooperation we shall now conduct our readers to the hotel of madame d'harville the following dialogue will abundantly prove that in adopting a tone of kind and gentle conciliation towards a husband she had hitherto treated with such invariable coldness and reserve the heart of madame d'harville had already determined to practise the sound and virtuous sentiments dictated by rodolph the marquis and his lady had just quitted the dinner-table and the scene we are about to describe took place in the elegant little salon we have already spoken of the features of clemence wore an expression of kindness almost amounting to tenderness and even m d'harville appeared less sad and dejected than usual it only remains to premise that the marquis had not as yet received the last infamous production of the pen of sarah macgregor what are your arrangements for this evening inquired m d'harville almost mechanically of his wife i have no intention of going out and what are your own plans i hardly know answered he with a sigh i feel more than ordinarily averse to gaiety and i shall pass my evening as i have passed many others alone nay but why alone since i am not going out m d'harville gazed at his wife as though unable to comprehend her i am aware said he that you mentioned your intention to pass this evening at home still i pray go on my lord i did not imagine you would choose to have your solitude broken in upon i believe you have always expressed a wish to be alone when you did not receive company perhaps i may have done so said clemence with a smile but let me for once plead my sex's privilege of changing my mind and so even at the risk of astonishing you by my caprice i will own that i should greatly prefer sharing my solitude with you that is if it would be quite agreeable to you oh how very good of you exclaimed m d'harville with much delight thus to anticipate my most ardent desire which i durst not have requested had you not so kindly encouraged me ah oh, my lord your very surprise is a severe reproach to me a reproach oh not for worlds would i have you so understand me but to find you so kindly considerate so attentive to my wishes after my cruel and unjust conduct the other day does i confess both shame and surprise me though the surprise is of the most gratifying and delightful sort come come my lord said madame d'harville with a smile of heavenly sweetness let the past be for ever forgotten between us can you clemence said m d'harville can you bring yourself to forget that i have dared to suspect you that hurried on by a wild insensate jealousy i mediated violence i now shudder to think of still what are even these deep offences to the greater and more irreparable wrong i have done you again i say returned clemence making a violent effort to command herself let us forget the past what do i hear can you or is it possible you will pardon me and forget all the past i will try to do so and i fear not but i shall succeed o oh, clemence can you indeed be so generous but no no i dare not hope it i have long since resigned all expectation that such happiness would ever be mine and now you see how wrong you were in coming to such a conclusion but how comes this blessed change or do i dream speak to me clemence 
tell me i am not deceiving myself that all is not mere illusion speak say that i must trust my senses indeed you may i mean all i have said and now i look at you i see more kindness in your eye your manner is less cold your voice tremulous oh tell me tell me is this indeed true or am i the sport of some illusion nay my lord all is true and safely to be believed i too have need of pardon at your hands and therefore i propose that we mutually exchange forgiveness you clemence you need forgiveness oh for what or wherefore have i not been frequently unkind unrelenting and perhaps even cruel towards you ought i not to have remembered that it required a more than ordinary share of courage to act otherwise than you did a virtue more than human to renounce the hope of exchanging a cheerless solitary life for one of wedded sympathy and happiness alas when we are in grief or suffering it is so natural to trust to the kindness and goodness of others hitherto your fault has been in depending too much on my generosity henceforward it shall be my aim to show you you have not trusted in vain oh go on go on continue still to utter such heavenly words exclaimed m d'harville gazing in almost ecstasy on the countenance of his wife and clasping his hands in fervid supplication let me again hear you pronounce my pardon and it will seem as though a new existence were opening upon me our destinies are inseparably united and death only can dissever us believe me it shall for the future be my study to render life less painful to you than it has been merciful heaven do i hear aright clemence can it be you who have spoken these dear these enchanting words let me conjure you to spare me the pain and humiliation of hearing you express so much astonishment at my speaking as my duty prompts me to do indeed your reluctance to credit my assertions grieves me more than i can describe how cruel a censure does it imply upon my past conduct ah who will pity and soothe you in your severe trials if not i i seem inspired by some holy voice speaking within my breast to reflect upon my past conduct i have deeply meditated on all that has happened as well as on the future my faults rise up in judgment against me but with them come also the whisperings of my awakened feelings teaching me how to repair my past errors your errors my poor injured clemence alas you were not to blame yes i was i ought frankly to have appealed to your honour to release me from the painful necessity of living with you as your wife and that too on the day following our marriage clemence for pity's sake no more otherwise in accepting my position i ought to have elevated it by my entire submission and devotion under the circumstances in which i was placed instead of allowing my coldness and proud reserve to act as a continual reproach i should have directed all my endeavours to console you for so heavy a misfortune and have forgotten everything but the severe affliction under which you laboured by degrees i should have become attached to my work of commiseration and probably the very cares and sacrifices it would have required to fulfil my voluntary duty for which your grateful appreciation would have been a rich reward i might at last but what ails you my lord are you ill surely you are weeping but they are tears of pure delight ah you can scarcely imagine what new emotions are awakened in my heart heed not my tears beloved clemence trust me they flow from an excess of happiness arising from those dear words you just now uttered never did i seem so guilty in my own eyes as i now appear for having selfishly bound you to such a life as mine and never did i find myself more disposed to forget the past and to bury all reference to it in oblivion the sight of your gently falling tears even seems to me to open a source of happiness hitherto unknown to me courage courage let us in place of that bright and prosperous life denied us by providence seek our enjoyment in the discharge of the serious duties allotted us let us be mutually indulgent and forbearing towards each other and should our resolution fail let us turn to our child and make her the depositary of all our affections thus shall we secure to ourselves an unfailing store of holy of tranquil joys sure tis some angel speaks 
cried m d'harville contemplating his wife with impassioned looks oh clemence you little know the pleasure and the pain you cause me the severest reproach you ever addressed me your hardest word or most merited rebuke never touched me as does this angelic devotion this disregard of self this generous sacrifice of personal enjoyment even despite myself i feel hope spring up within me i dare hardly trust myself to believe the blessed future which suggests itself to my imagination ah you may safely and implicitly believe all i say albert i declare to you by all that is sacred and solemn that i have firmly taken the resolution i spoke of and that i will adhere to it in strictest word and deed hereafter i may even be enabled to give you further pledges of my truth pledges exclaimed m d'harville more and more excited by a happiness so wholly unlocked for what need have i of any pledges do not your look your tone the heavenly expression of goodness which animates your countenance the rapturous pulsations of my own heart all convince me of the truth of your words but clemence man you know is a creature not easily satisfied and added the marquis approaching his wife's chair your noble generous conduct inspires me with the boldness the courage to hope to hope yes clemence to venture to hope for that which only yesterday i should have considered even worse than madness to presume to think of for mercy's sake explain yourself said clemence alarmed at the impassioned words and glances of her husband yes cried he seizing her hand yes by dint of tender untiring unwearied love clemence do you understand me i say by dint of love such as mine i venture to hope to obtain a return of my affection i dare to anticipate being loved by you not with a cold lukewarm regard but with a passion ardent as my own for you ah you know not the real nature of such a love as i would inspire you with alas i never even dared to breathe it in your ears so frigid so repulsive were you to me never did you bestow on me a look a word of kindness far less make my heart leap with such joy as thrilled through my breast but now when your words of sweet and gentle tenderness drew happy tears from my eyes and which still ringing in my ears make me almost beside myself with gladness and amid the intoxicating delight which floats through my brain comes the proud consciousness of having earned even so rich a reward by the deep the passionate ardour of my love for you o oh, clemence when will you let me only tell you half i have suffered how i have writhed in despairing anguish at your coldness your disdain how i have watched and sighed in vain for one encouraging glance you will own that for patient devotion to one beloved object i am inferior to none whence arose that melancholy that avoidance of all society our best friends have so fruitlessly sought to rouse me from can you not guess the cause ah uh, it originated in desolation of spirit and despair of ever obtaining your love yes dearest clemence to that overwhelming dread was owing the sombre taciturnity the dislike to company the desponding gloom which excited so many different conjectures think too how much my sufferings must have been increased by the fact that she the beloved object of my heart's idolatry was my own legally irrevocably mine dwelling beneath the same roof yet more completely alienated from me than though we dwelt in the opposite parts of the earth but my burning sighs my bitter tears reach not you for i feel almost persuaded they would have moved even you to pity me and now it seems to me that you must have divined my sufferings and have come like an angel of goodness as you are to whisper in my ears bright promises of days of unclouded happiness no longer shall i be doomed to gaze in unavailing yet doting admiration on your graceful beauty no more shall i account myself most blessed yet most accursed in possessing a creature of matchless excellence whose charms of mind and body alas i am forbidden to consider as mine but now the envious barrier which has thus long divided us is about to be withdrawn and the treasure my beating heart tells me is all my own will henceforward be freely indisputably mine will it not dear clemence speak to me 
and confirm that which the busy throbbings of my joyful heart tell me to hope for and expect as the reward of all i have so long endured as m d'harville uttered these last words he seized the hand of his wife and covered it with passionate kisses while clemence much grieved at the mistake her husband had fallen into could not avoid withdrawing her hand with a mixture of terror and disgust and the expression of her countenance so plainly bespoke her feelings that m d'harville saw at once the fearful error he had committed the blow fell with redoubled force after the tender visions he had so lately conjured up a look of intense agony replaced the bright exultation of his countenance exhibited a little while since when madame d'harville eagerly extending her hand towards him said in an agitated tone albert receive my solemn promise to be unto you as the most tender and affectionate sister but nothing more forgive me i beseech you if inadvertently my words have inspired you with hopes which can never be realized never exclaimed m d'harville fixing on his wife a look of despairing entreaty never answered she the single word with the tone in which it was spoken proved but too well the irrevocable decision clemence had formed brought back by the influence of rodolph to all her nobleness of character madame d'harville had firmly resolved to bestow on her husband every kind and affectionate attention but to love him she felt utterly out of her power and to this immutable resolution she was driven by a power more forcible than either fear contempt or even dislike it was a species of repugnance almost amounting to horror after a painful silence of some duration m d'harville passed his hand across his moist eyelids and said in a voice of bitterness let me entreat your pardon for the unintentional mistake i have made oh refuse not to forgive me for having ventured to believe that happiness could exist for me and again a long pause ensued broken at last by d'harville's vehemently exclaiming what a wretch am i albert said clemence gently for worlds would i not reproach you yet is my promise of being unto you the most loving and affectionate of sisters unworthy any estimation you will receive from the tender cares of devoted friendship more solid happiness than love could afford look forward to brighter days hitherto you have found me almost indifferent to your sorrows you shall henceforward find me all zeal and solicitude to alleviate them and eager to share with you every grief or cause of suffering whether of body or of mind at this moment a servant throwing open the folding doors announced his highness the grand duke of gerolstein m d'harville started then by a powerful effort recovering his self-command he advanced to meet his visitor i am singularly fortunate madame said rodolph approaching clemence to find you at home to-night and i am still more delighted with my good fortune since it procures me the pleasure of meeting you also my dear albert continued he turning to the marquis and shaking him cordially by the hand it is indeed some time since i have had the honour of paying my respects to your royal highness if the truth must be spoken my dear albert said the prince smilingly you are somewhat platonic in your friendships and relying on the certain attachment of your friends care very little about either giving or receiving any outward proof of affection by a breach of etiquette which somewhat annoyed madame d'harville a servant here entered the room with a letter for the marquis it was the anonymous epistle of sarah accusing rodolph of being the lover of madame d'harville the marquis out of deference for the prince put away with his hand the small silver salver presented to him by the servant saying in an undertone another time another time my dear albert said rodolph in a voice of the most genuine affection why all this ceremony with me my lord with madame d'harville's permission let me beg of you to read your letter without delay i assure you my lord it is not of the slightest consequence again i say albert read your letter all the same for my being here but my lord indeed nay i ask you to do so or if you will have it i desire you to read it immediately if your highness commands it my duty is obedience said the marquis taking the letter from the salver yes i positively command you to treat me as an old friend ought to treat another then turning towards madame d'harville while the marquis was breaking the seal of the fatal letter the contents of which were of course unknown to rodolph he said smilingly to madame d'harville 
what a triumph for you madame to bend this untractable spirit and make it bow to your very caprice m d'harville having opened sarah's infamous letter approached the wax lights burning on the mantelpiece the better to read it his features bore no visible mark of agitation as he perused the vile scrawl a slight trembling of the hand alone was visible as after a short hesitation he refolded the paper and placed it in the pocket of his waistcoat at the risk of passing for a perfect goth said he with a smile to rodolph i will ask you to excuse me my lord while i retire to reply to this letter which is more important than it at first appeared shall i not see you again this evening i am fearful i shall not have that honour my lord and i trust your royal highness will condescend to excuse me what a slippery person you are cried rodolph gaily will you not madame endeavour to prevent his quitting us nay i dare not attempt that your highness has failed to accomplish but seriously my dear albert endeavour to come back as soon as you have concluded your letter or if that is not possible promise to give me a few minutes in the morning i have a thousand things to say to you your highness overwhelms me with kindness answered the marquis as bowing profoundly he withdrew leaving clemence and the prince alone your husband has some heavy care on his mind observed rodolph to the marquise his smile appeared to me a forced one at the moment of your highness's arrival m d'harville was much excited and he has had great difficulty in concealing his agitation from you my visit was probably mal à propos oh no my lord you came just in time to spare me the conclusion of a most painful conversation indeed may i inquire the subject of it i had explained to m d'harville the line of conduct i had determined to pursue towards him for the future assuring him of my future sympathy and affectionate attention to his happiness how happy you must have rendered him by such gratifying words he did indeed at first seem most truly happy and so was i likewise for his tears and his joys caused in me a feeling of delight i never before experienced once i fancied i did but indulge a just revenge each time i addressed to him a reproach or a sarcasm but it was a weak and impotent mode of torture which always recoiled upon myself as my better judgment pointed out the unworthiness of such conduct while just now how great was the difference i had inquired of my husband if he were going out to which he mournfully replied that he had no intention of so doing but should pass the evening alone as he most frequently did ah my lord could you but have seen his surprise when i offered to be his companion and how suddenly did the gloomy expression of his features give place to a bright glow of happiness ah you were quite right there is nothing more really delightful than preparing happy surprises for those around us but how could so much kindness on your part have brought about the painful conversation you were alluding to just now alas my lord said clemence blushing deeply m d'harville not satisfied with the hopes i felt myself justified in holding out allowed himself to form others of a nature too tender to admit of their being realized and in proportion to my consciousness of my utter inability to respond to such sentiments had been my anxiety not to arouse them and greatly as i had felt touched by the warmth of my husband's gratitude for my preferred affection i was even still more terrified and alarmed by the passionate ardour of his manner and expressions and when carried away by the impetuosity of his feelings he pressed his lips upon my hand a cold shudder pervaded my whole frame and i found it impossible to conceal the disgust and alarm i experienced doubtless this manifestation of my invincible repugnance pained him deeply and i much lament having been unable to prevent his perceiving my feelings but now that the blow has fallen it will at least serve to convince m d'harville of the utter impossibility of my ever being more to him than the most tender and devoted friend i pity him most sincerely without being able to blame you in the slightest degree for the part you have acted there are certain feelings which must ever be held sacred but poor albert with his noble generous spirit his frank confiding nature his warm enthusiastic heart if you only knew how long i have been vainly trying to discover the cause of the hidden melancholy which was evidently preying upon his health well we must trust to the soothing effects of time and reason by degrees he will become more sensible of the value of the affection you offer him and he will resign himself as he did before when he had not the consolatory hopes you now present to his view hopes which i solemnly assure you my lord 
it is my fixed determination to realize in their fullest extent end of chapter six part one read by celine major